we are calling, in English, we call this program Dzogchen Cycles, Heart Essence Transmission. And this is a way of expressing a, a phrase that Rinpoche came up with many years ago. It's actually a name that he gave uh, his community, a very beautiful name, about four o'clock in the morning, I think, in my house. A few of us are sitting around. Dzogchen Ningtik. So Dzogchen, of course, is Dzogchen. Dzog means great. It means complete. And it, well, Dzog by itself means complete or it means perfect. It's complete in the sense that everything is included, meaning that all of the practices that we are doing in ways that I'll say a little bit more about shortly are part of, are imbued with, are suffused with Dzogchen. And Chen means great. So the word Dzogchen, you often see it translated as the great perfection. You also see it translated as the great completeness. And what it is identifying, that name is identifying, is that we all of us, no matter what we look like from the outside, we all of us right now already since forever are a great completeness. But we can't see it. It's like gold underground, you know, it's pure gold and there's nothing you have to do to that gold to fix it up, but you have to part the earth. Or it's like a, a flame in a cup. These are actually examples from one of the first texts we'll be studying. And the flame is fine, it's burning, it's shining. You don't have to, you know, look for a flame, but you do have to open the cup or perforate the cup. Many, many metaphors like this. So Dzogchen, the great completeness, is a teaching, much like Chan, if you're familiar with Chan or Son or Zen, um, that its starting point is that already everything, that means everything in you, in the depths of who and what you already are, is perfect. And we look at our lives and we think, that sounds pretty crazy. <laughs> And so we do some investigation and see uh, how we can come to recognize this in ourselves. And that's really what the path is about, to see what's always been there. So Dzogchen and then Ning Tik. Ning means heart. And Tik often is translated as essence, sometimes as uh, in this case, essence. So this phrase, heart essence, is well known in Tibet. Uh, and there are numerous heart essence lineage traditions of Dzogchen in Tibet. There is, above all for us, the Longchen Yingtik, heart essence, vast expanse. Our foundational practices that we do, um, various teachings, the, the, the refuge and bodhicitta that we sing, uh, are from Jigme Lingpa. Ajahn Rinpoche is considered reincarnation of Jigme Lingpa. Jigme Lingpa. And then, um, so Guru Rinpoche in about the 8th century, according to traditional chronologies, um, Vimalamitra about the same time, Longchemba in the 14th century, Jigme Lingpa in the 18th century, Ajahn Trukpa, very significant in bringing Hard essence, vast expanse, the long chin ning tick into the 20th century. And he was the father, as I mentioned, of our own Azum Pela Rinpoche and Jade Sima in their previous lifetime. So, what am I saying? I'm saying if you don't believe past lives, you know, this won't make any sense to you. No, I think at the very least, we can understand that energetically speaking and in the way that we hold these traditions, we feel very, very connected to them because we know Rinpoche and he is whatever this might mean to us symbolically or feel that it's literally true. He has a profound connection with all of these Dzogchen lineages, with the Longchen Ningtik and the others that I mentioned. And he also has his own lineage called the Usel Ningtik, uh, the luminous Usel, we just call it, or the, the luminous heart drop, luminous heart essence, essence. Heart essence a lineage. And these are his treasures that he uh, discovered, that he revealed to him in his own mind, and that we are now including in our program. It was always our intention and hope that we would be able to include it, but we couldn't do it until he said we could. 
And so in Tibetan and Dzogchen Nyingtik, we can add korlo, which means cycles, which is our word. So for short, in English, we're calling this program Dzogchen Cycles. It is centered on the uh, long chen ying tic, hard essence, vast expanse, which is a full path from beginning to end. Uh, it is the most, I have heard, the most widely uh, practiced Dzogchen lineage in Tibet. There certainly are others which are wonderful. And we are very much in a non-sectarian spirit. In praising this, we are not uh, unpraising others, but you know you have to focus especially in the Tibetan tradition. There's this constellation of dazzling things over here and this amazing galaxy over here. And honestly, I know a lot of people who hop from one to the other and they're always sort of high, but they're not getting a coherent path. And this is some, that means a stages of the path, moving through the stages. I mean, you wouldn't go to, uh, you know, you wouldn't take algebra if you didn't know the multiplication table, I don't think, even now, right? They're not doing that. There, there are <laughs> stages of practice. We understand this when it comes to our own education. And somehow, often, at least in this culture, you know, the, the teaching gets unmoored from any kind of actually logical sequencing. And people just, you know, a teacher appears here and they go and do this and they go and do that. And that can be great as long as you know where to put things. So we all are teachers and we after them are really very emphatic that we proceed in a, in a way that uh, will actually build, build skills and, and build possibility for us. So that's why we call it the Dzogchen Cycles. Now, the Dzogchen Cycles program itself uh, begins with our week-long retreat in May. It's May 5th or May 12th, as Harvey said. And this, what we're going to, and we, um, what we're going to do in this particular retreat is the uh, seven trainings of Longchenpa. Longchen Rapcham, 14th century, considered the, the greatest of the greatest, really, of uh, Nyingma philosophers and practitioners. Uh, Longchen Rapcham is, wrote this, it's a very short text, actually, that is the foundation for Dzogchen practice. He explicit, interestingly enough, he includes it in his uh, very, very esoteric collections of texts. This is a text that is explicitly uh, opening the way and actually including in itself the Dzogchen teachings. And Adzum Rinpoche, Adzum Rinpoche taught it twice. He uh, told me to teach it because he said uh, it is, if somebody has this as uh, an entryway, as a training ground, he says, I'll sign my name to it. He would say that once in a while, very dramatically. I'll sign my name to it. You will do well. You will really move forth in, in a good way. And indeed, um, we use it with the commentary of Jigme Lingba, which has just come out in English. I've had it thanks to Cortland Dahl for a number of years, and whenever I've taught the seven trainings, I have used it. And now you will be able to read it in English, and uh, we are also gathering Rinpoche's own oral commentary on this. And what Jigme Lingba makes very clear in, in his discussion of this, he uses stories. He used little, little dramas that we kind of use our imagination around and um, in the process learn a lot about ourselves, which is, of course, the purpose of any teaching, really, to, I think, uh, you know, as... Um, uh, what is his name? Suzaki, Suzuki Roshi famously said, to study Buddhism is to study the self and to realize that what we thought was self, I'll add, and to realize that what we thought was self is not what we thought it was. But that's what we learn when we study the self. So always our intention as practitioners is to learn about ourselves, to see what, what's going on, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And that's why we need friends, by the way, to hold our hands and to say it's all right when we start seeing, you know, this, this, there's some rotten stuff in Denmark. <laughs> and, and when it comes out, it can be really hard. And 
We need friends. We need spiritual friends. Not just people to drink off our anxiety with, but really to look at it and grow from it and shed it, finally. So, um, one thing that is very clear from the way Jimmy Lingba uses these stories is that in doing these seven trainings, in actually in each of the trainings, we are moving from the sutra phase of practice through tantra and to Dzogchen itself. And in fact, the seventh training contains uh, elements that are central to the famous and esoteric and usually very uh, hidden practices of Dzalung, the training in the channels and winds, which is another way of training the body. Once we've figured out that we have a body, finally, as Westerners, there's really a lot to train as we get in touch with more subtle aspects of the body. So all of that is in these seven trainings of Along Chemba. That's our first retreat. Now, alongside of that, and a very complementary to it, there is something called that I've been calling seeing to being. Um, so in 2000, which is really a framework for everything. It is something which includes everything. Yeah, and and so he gave me four very, very simple principles. It was kind of like, here are some seeds. And I thought about them for a while, a long time actually. And then in 2007 at Samya Chimpok, and also in the last few years when I've been able to go to China, I told him, I started teaching it, some of what I've taught here and in California and Portland and Olympia, uh, and actually in Switzerland also, have been elements from this. So you have seen some of it already. Uh, it's really simple. Um, he identifies four faculties that we already have, as I've mentioned before, and then I have inspired by various things that he has said and, and just putting together things in different ways, um, organize these into uh, four stages of seeing. So he says seeing, everybody knows how to see in some sense. Everybody knows, so in other words, using our senses. And when, once we see things, once we actually have a capacity for paying attention, so that within the category of seeing this first phase of uh, these practices, all of our attentional practices are included. We've done some of them already, focusing, um, open attention, being part of a field, connecting with your body in the process of paying attention. All of this is part of what is meant by seeing here. It's actually quite rich already. But once we can see, then we get curious. What's this? Look at it more cl closely. Especially, what's this? <laughs> Who am I? What's going on? So there's seeing, seeking, and as we uh, look into things, uh, kind of, we realize that things aren't as, you know, just like ice can melt. Really, anything that we look at turns out to have an interior structure that can open up and show much more space in the situation than we ever thought was possible. And so this uh, fires our imagination. We use our imagination, much as we all do in Tantra, also imagine using our imagination, our vision. And like a river flowing to an ocean, uh, very naturally we move through this process of engaging through particular, each of these stages has different levels of practices, um, seeing, seeking, vision, and just naturally we land in being which is the heart and soul of Dzogchen, which is actually a state and orientation that uh, underlies the entirety of the path. This is something that becomes very clear in our practice of the seven trainings. As I said, Jigme Lingba takes us in each of them through really all of the stages of the path, and we see that everything, sometimes the the, the, the stages of the path are, are you know, pictured and imagined as a kind of ladder or a hierarchy, and you know, we climb up the ladder from Sutra to Tantra to Dzogchen. But really, my experience and interpretation, and I find this very reinforced by Jigme Lingba, is that really what we see is that 
Dzogchen, our being, our state of being, our real nature that nothing could ever change or taint, is present in everything. It backlights the entire path. It's not something that we claw our way towards. It's something that we open towards through uh, the different practices that we do. So I've, for that reason, seeing, so to speak, flows into being. It's a natural, like a, maybe even better than a river, I could use the metaphor of a waterfall. You know, if we just follow the path, we will come to this ocean of being that we already are. Rinpoche's name for this was, is, one of his names for it in Tibetan is Simni Rangdrol, which literally means something like my nature freeing everything or naturally freeing. It's a very Dzogchen phrase. One of Longchenpa's greatest works has this very same title. So imagine my surprise when Rinpoche said, that's what this is. That actually was a teaching for me to understand how all-encompassing this very simple uh, set of uh, um, principles that he gave me and which I've developed. And then as I developed them, I ran them by him and, and to my amazement and delight, he was like, yeah, okay, and now where do we go from here? It was like he was right away, right, right with it. So that is our first retreat. So sweet. Let me say something. Please. So I just put a few very short addenda onto what Anne added. Um, one is that we really all have grown up in a book culture in this society, and we think of knowledge as formulated on the pages of a book or on the the outlines of a of a blackboard. And um, actually, instruction in Tibet, and in particular in the Dzogchen tradition, the practice traditions, is very, very dr uh, different. And it, it relies on uh, what are called oral quintessential instructions. And quintessential means like really, you know, condensed, 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 very, very powerful. And it's, it's good that Anne sort of just said that the, uh, the name of the teachings, because really what Rinpoche offered her was four quintessential instructions. And the nature of these quintessential instructions is that for us as students, we take them in, but we continue to contemplate them. There really are like zip drives that have a kind of infinite capacity for opening. So even the name Semnyi Rangdol, it's got four syllables, the first two, Semnyi is nature of mind. And the second two, a rang, is a kind of interesting word. It can mean natural, it can mean self, and droll means liberate. You know, Anne actually just translated it one way. I tend to think of it another way, but that's just the richness of the phrase because rangdol can refer to sort of the and this is pretty much true of some very, very profound things in general in Tibetan practice, can talk about kind of the, the path is a path of natural liberation. You're naturally liberating into the mind nature, but it's also the mind nature itself that is naturally liberating us. So it's both, in a way, an effect of our practice. It's very natural to liberate into the mind nature, but also it's actually very nat natural for our main, my nature to liberate us. And you know, we think we're doing a lot of work and la-di-da-di-da, but from a certain profound perspective, our main, my nature is just liberating us. We're not actually doing anything. So it's just to say, even something short, most of these quintessential instructions tend to be quite brief, very pithy, but they have a lot of depth and uh, can be a source of amazing over and over reflection. The other thing, and it's um, hard to really say this in a way, hard to describe it, and but I do think it's pretty unusual. Um, we've seen a lot of sanghas, we've seen a lot of teachers, and 
it's it's very very usual for wise Tibetan teachers to dispense knowledge. It just is. They are fonts of knowledge, and then the students imbibe the knowledge. It's a little bit really unusual for someone as vastly, notoriously talented as Azam Rinpoche to sit down and collegially work with Really. Well, a student, any student. But a woman yeah. and a student. And so this speaks to a particular relationship that Anne has with Adza Rinpoche, and there's backstory to that, which we won't address right now. But um, it really is unusual to hear about this collegial relationship and that this semi rondo my nature naturally liberating you know arises from this collegial relationship it's quite a blessing and you know Anne does not toot her own horn but there is a kind of historic and, and religiously significant aspect to that collaboration that just needs to be kind of underlined and put into bold print. So <laughs> now we come, I think, to the what. Well, that right? was part of the what. That, that was, was the part first of the retreat. What. That was the first part of the what. So that's our first retreat. Um, we can't wait. <laughs> And we want to tell you now uh, succinctly, because we want to have time to actually talk to you and hear what you're hearing and what questions you have, uh, about the program itself and its unique features and its benefits. You will find on our uh, Dzogchen Cycles landing page the actual outline of the schedule. And At least for the first uh, year. The right? first year, the second two years, uh, we're rearranging right now a little bit because they're going to include some of Rinpoche's own uh, tear. But just um, some highlights. I think I'll be very brief about this because we want to, one of the most unique things about the program, well, there's two unique things about the program. Uh, there's the program itself, what we're teaching, and then there's the structure of the program, which Harvey's going to talk about. I think we can do that pretty pretty swiftly, and then we can hear your questions. Uh, so you've heard about the first retreat, which is in May. Then generally, our, the pattern for this program for the three years is that, that there will be a week-long retreat, probably usually around the first week of May. There will be a fall and a spring weekend retreats. For those of you who don't live in Houston, you can do this online, but for all the reasons that Harvey has said already, about the importance of sangha and community. We really, we're not just trying to dispense teachings. Actually, we're really seeking to uh, hold and, and, and uh, encourage and nurture and celebrate and enjoy a community, a community of practitioners. So we do ask that those of you who uh, come into the program, that you come once a year if you possibly can, uh, so that we'll know you and uh, you will also, as Harvey will talk about, get uh, a friend, a spiritual friend who, who's a, a longtime student who can, you know, kind of help you and support you in your practice. Let me just say one thing, dear. Okay. So it, it definitely is possible to get a transmission via uh, video, via long distance with great spiritual teachers and with great spiritual teachings. The blessing power of the teaching stream itself can be conveyed. But I, I recently read a, a wonderful little snippet in a Dzogchen Tantra where it said that geese provide quintessential instructions to one another through beating their wings near one another. And this is a kind of quintessential instruction. And uh, it really speaks to the fact that when we are in a community with one another, 
not only are teachers providing blessings vertically, but as geese, just by being in a space one with another, we are providing quintessential support and energetic support for realization with one another. It's tremendously meaningful, quintessential instruction to contemplate. Okay. So we do want to have some in-person contact as part of this. Our fall retreat will be uh, a short practice for accomplishing Guru Rinpoche from Rinpoche's own, our own Adzan Rinpoche's Ursel Nyingtik. He just handed it to me one day. <laughs> and uh, so he has uh, encouraged us to include it here. We haven't taught it before, but once we do it, it is imbued with its Dzogchen teaching itself. However, these, these uh, texts are beautiful and simple and s exquisite in that everybody will understand it at different levels. You know, if you have a Dzogchen orientation already, you will understand something. If you don't, you will understand something. It's quite short. And then in the winter, our Losar retreat, we will uh, do the uh, the Luchen, the body offering or Jiu practice from Jigme Lingba's own Nundro. This is very famous and it's hardly ever taught as far as I can tell. And uh, when we mentioned this to Rinpoche, he said, oh, uh, do mine too. So we will teach it with, he has full, he has done a compilation of it, which includes some other prayers and so on. Uh, so that's, I guess, February-ish 218. And uh, there will also, I think in the second year, we will also include the Yeshe Tsogel from Rinpoche's own Ursel Nyingtik uh, transmission. And uh, a few people have tasted that, but it hasn't been made available until now. He has said now is the time. And uh, this is just, just a, an exquisite practice. Yeah, so that teaching... It's a Dakini practice. The, yeah. the Dakini mm. treasure will be part of the week-long retreat in the second year, which will also oh, include... the second year, that's right. ...teachings on Tara. But so that's our Dakini uh, week-long with Green Tara. Anybody and who's really participated in that has been um, very, very touched and, and, and influenced. Um, it's just very, very uh, significant treasure. But I think then we're going to move on to okay, let's the program. Move on. Yeah. So what are is unique and what are the benefits of this program? Um, so um, this program is going to include our first and third Tuesday evening teachings and our retreats, and these will be continue to be open to all interested and sincere practitioners. Um, the program is really meant for people who hope to be able to commit some significant amount of time to daily practice according each to every person's individual consideration, and that will be slightly different for everyone. And in addition, the program as a program, in addition to the Tuesday evening teachings and to the retreats per se, people in the program will have a mentor assigned to them who will be able to consult with individuals about their practice. There'll be a live webinar open only to program participants with the two of us every six to eight weeks. There will, be, there will be a once a month live facilitated web support discussion group only open to program participants. There'll be a list serve uh, dedicated to participants in the program. And then once a year, people who are in the program will meet with either Anne or myself uh, personally or by Skype, depending on what the logistics are. Um, and how this will benefit individuals that people will be able to fine tune their practice and their questions through meeting with their teachers and their spiritual friends. And we are, we are having a uh, concurrent training program for the spiritual friends. These are uh, longtime students who we know well, who we have invited to be part of that. 
and we just had our first training on Saturday. So they will be getting training in how to work with you, and if anything naughty comes up, uh, they will also talk with us. So we are, we're trying to have a, you know, a real holding. Practice, if you really practice, you know, it's not always easy going. And so we want to, we've done all of these infrastructure, a lot of discussion with a lot of important input from Claire, actually a program director too, so that we want to offer those of you who are committing, we are also committing to uh, provide a holding and a structure to support you. And, and we really are looking to create an online and in-person practice community that in some senses transcends the limitations of physical location. Um, so yes, our spiritual friends are in ongoing training with us and as of now we'll probably be able to accommodate somewhere between 50 to 80 participants in the program. And so others who can't be in the program can still participate in our Tuesday nights, can participate in our retreats, but we won't be able to provide the level of support to everybody that we just enumerated, and so those who aren't enrolled in the program won't be able to have that level of support. Um, we will have a waiting list if we do fill up. 